This is a presentation on criminal procedure in Victoria on the topic of search and seizure of evidential material in the year 2013. Now this topic can be quite tricky because there are many, many uh, provisions, many, many procedures. It gets quite finicky and you can really get lost in the morass of detail. So what I've tried to do is to organize this presentation around a few central principles that are pretty much always at play and also to divide the scenarios into uh, scenarios that are quite easy to imagine. So rather than thinking along the lines of sections and subsections, I've tried to, as much as possible, to think of real-world scenarios that make it easier to apply these principles to. So the central question when we're talking about search and seizure of evidential material <coughs> is, of course, whether that material is admissible. Everything that the police do, all of the procedures they follow in order to obtain this evidential material uh, has the ultimate, the single and ultimate purpose of uh, being admitted to court, of presenting it for admission at trial. So the number one question is whether the evidential material is admissible at trial, is going to be admitted at trial, and if it's not ostensibly admissible, is there anything that can be done about it? And the own and and pretty much the only way of ascertaining whether it's admissible is to ask whether it was lawfully obtained. There are exceptions that I'll get to later, but that's the central question: whether the evidential material was lawfully obtained. Now, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that we have to ask whether the police had the lawful authority to search the suspect and seize evidential material. I'm going to use the abbreviation D for suspect, even though in Victoria we don't uh, use the term defendant anymore, we uh, talk about the accused. Uh, but D is just a really handy abbreviation and that's what I'm going to go with. So very simply, if, D, if, if the police had the lawful authority at the time to search the suspect, now the accused, and seize evidential material, then the evidential material is admissible. And if not, it's not admissible. It's unlawfully obtained. So let's see what we mean by that. So the two, broadly speaking, there are two scenarios that, that we look at when considering search and seizure. We're looking at search and seizure in a public place or search and seizure at the suspect's premises, at his home, at his place of work, uh, any place that he occupies, really. Let's start with the public place. And with both public place and, um, and uh, matters concerning entry of a premises, there are basically four questions. Warrant, statute, common law, consent. Do, do the police have a warrant? Are they empowered by statute? Do they have authority deriving from the common law? Or did they obtain the consent of the suspect to conduct the search and ultimately the seizure. Well, uh, that's and and that's uh, uh, just a nice, neat way um, of of organizing your thoughts. So you're faced with a, a scenario, and you can just run through mine: warrant, statute, common law, consent. So let's get into consideration of the public place, and then we'll go to other questions of premises entering the premises and searching the place. So the first question, warrant in a public place. Do the police have a warrant for search and seizure? Most of the time, we're, you don't really look at uh, warrants when you're talking about search and seizure in a public place. Uh, but there is one important uh, scenario, which is on board an aircraft. Uh, obviously, this uh, arises from a concern about uh, hijacking an aircraft or people uh, going crazy on planes. Um, now, if the police are on the plane as people are boarding or have just boarded, chances are they've been tipped off, chances are they've already applied to a magistrate, and for the police to uh, apprehend and search people merely on the basis of a reasonable belief that the suspect is involved in an offence involving the safety of an aircraft, i.e. hijacking, then they need authorization in writing from a magistrate. It's also important to point out 
that if the police aren't there but uh, it comes to the attention of persons in control of the aircraft, the pilot and whatnot, they don't need authorization writing from a, a magistrate or anyone to apprehend and search a suspect if they have a reasonable belief thereof. Also worth pointing out that um, a female suspect can be searched by a, fe by a woman only. Um, I assume that this is to accommodate some, possibly some cultural sensitivities, but that's a very specific um, point in, uh, point in, the, in the legislation, the Crimes Act 1958, section 469A, so I assume that if there's an exam and it talks about getting authorization in writing and someone's behaving crazy on an aircraft and then it's a, but it's a woman and she gets searched by a man, then, it, then the question comes up of whether that was a lawful search. So just bear in mind, if you do get a question about a woman being searched on an aeroplane, there is that little detail about um, the requirement that a female suspect uh, can be searched by a woman only. Otherwise, um, the Crimes Act uh, gives them, gives the police the authority to uh, suspicion. Sorry, <laughs> have to fix that up. Uh, it's re mostly about on board an aircraft, and actually, that's not correct either. So we're just talking about on board an aircraft. And otherwise, uh, if we're talking about a warrant, then we're talking about uh, a warrant for arrest. So if they do have a warrant for the arrest of the suspect, then uh, search and seizure is lawful. And if not, <coughs> uh, search and seizure is not lawful. Pretty simple. But um, if they have a warrant for the arrest of the suspect, then they're usually going to go to his home. They don't usually nab him off the street. So that's a uh, warrant. Uh, the authority deriving from a warrant in a public place, and I suspect that there aren't very many cases with that. It's usually going to be a question of statutory authority, and what statutes grant the police the authority to conduct search and seizure, to conduct searches of suspects and seize evidential material? Well, the main one, or the most common one at least, is arrest. So if the police have a reasonable suspicion, if it's a lawful arrest, i.e. they reasonable belief that the person in question is involved in a crime or about to commit a crime or all that sort of stuff, then they have the authority to arrest the person and pursuant to that arrest comes the authority to conduct a search. So search is basically um, an automatic, the, the right to search is an automatic consequence of a lawful arrest, but there is a question of reasonable seizure and I just want to open that up a little bit just to get into a couple of details that might come in handy. So if we're talking about search and seizure pursuant to arrest, or seizure pursuant to arrest, there are basically three um, uh, bullet points that you can, or checkpoints that you can refer to. Whether the item seized is reasonably connected to a crime, whether the item seized, if it's not reasonably connected to a crime, could be used to cause injury, or whether that item could be a tool which could aid an escape. So imagine the police have arrested someone for whatever reason. They take him to a police station and uh, they do a search and they take, uh, take away his, take away sharp objects, take away whatever they think could be used to cause an injury or which could be used to aid an escape and obviously anything that's reasonably connected to crime like a, a drug or a prohibited weapon. Um, and to illustrate this point, let us uh, just look at a couple of cases very briefly that uh, in, in which it was held that the seizure was not authorized, it was not reasonable. So the case of Lindley and Rutter, 1979. Uh, Lindley was a woman who was drunk and disorderly and arrested for basically making a nuisance of herself. I think she assaulted someone. She was taken to the police station, a policewoman tried to remove her bra and um, she objected to that rather violently and it went to court, 
and she went to this there was a trial for assaulting the policewoman and it was held that removing her bra was not reasonable similarly uh, the case of the, the the crown against Naylor I hope I pronounced it correctly similar situation arrested taken to police station and the police uh, re tried to remove her jewelry earrings necklace whatnot ostensibly for safekeeping she was very unhappy about it to put it mildly and uh, she also was uh, she had also went to trial for assaulting a police officer and it was held that removing jewellery in this case was not reasonable. Also, there are two other, actually three little other details that are handy to point out. Firstly, that it is uh, not sufficient merely to arrest the person and conduct a search. You actually have to provide, as the police, you have to provide reason for search, and that was the outcome of the uh, case of uh, Brazil against Chief Constable of Surrey. So arrested, searched, no reason given for search, that was held to be unreasonable. Another interesting uh, uh, detail is from the case of Davidson, uh, Crown, Crown against Davidson, 1991, where the point was made that search and seizure prior to arrest are unlawful. Now, if I recall correctly, uh, it was a woman, surname Davidson, she was pulled over by police. They, um, for whatever reason, searched her handbag and found a syringe, and I suppose they had an inkling that she was involved with, with drugs in some way. But they didn't arrest her. They simply pulled her over, and they reached, one of the policemen reached through the car window, grabbed a handbag, and rifled through it and found what, uh, he, what was held to be, what was uh, submitted as evidential material. And it was held uh, very, very clearly, in rather strong language, that uh, this was not the way to go. That uh, the correct procedure would have been to arrest her on suspicion of possession of drugs or whatever, what, what have you, and then to search her possessions, not to grab her handbag out of her car, look through it, and then arrest her upon discovering the offending item. So remember, search and seizure prior to arrest is unlawful. It has to be pursuant to arrest. And finally, um, the police have the authority to arrest. Obviously, they have the authority to arrest a suspect. They can search the suspect on the spot. They can take the suspect to the police station and conduct a search there. What they can't do is arrest the suspect and then take him to another location to conduct a search for an unrelated offence. This was brought to bear in the case of Jeffrey and Black, 1978. Jeffrey um, was arrested for stealing a sandwich from a pub. The pub called the police. The police uh, then took him to his flat or, or uh, coerced or at least uh, requested that he take them to his flat where they conducted a search and found some drugs in his home and it was ultimately held that the search of his flat was not authorized because they had arrested him for stealing a sandwich and then they went and searched his flat uh, for w without uh, any any justification or any authority to do so so remember the search had uh, search cannot be prior to arrest has to be pursuant to arrest it has to be at the place that the arrest takes place or at the police station and when the search is um, conducted, a reason has to be given for that search. So that's uh, that's pretty much that point. Let's save, and we'll come back there. So that's uh, pretty much arrest, and if arrest, uh, if, a, if a lawful arrest is made, a reason is provided, then the police have the authority to search the suspect's person, the suspect's bag, any vehicle in the suspect's control, so car or motorbike or boat or whatever vehicle that person might be driving. Pretty straightforward, really. But let's say we're not talking about arrest. Let's say we're talking about something else. Well, if it's not going to be arrest, it's usually going to be a stop and search provision. Now, stop and search provision is a special provision in, in certain acts, uh, Crimes Act and a couple others, where the police 
are given the very specific authority to uh, stop and search people without arresting them. So this is not uh, stopping someone, arresting him, then searching. It's stopping someone without arresting someone. And that usually takes place, that pretty much by law takes place in a designated area. So if you imagine uh, New Year's Eve in the city, if you're crazy enough to go to the city on New Year's Eve where there are half a million people packed into Federation Square, um, there will be certain areas, certain areas will be designated areas in which the police will have the authority to stop and search people uh, at their discretion. And within these designated areas, the police have the authority pursuant to Control of Weapons Act 1990, Section 10, to search someone's person or vehicle, to request identification, to detain for the person for as long as necessary, uh, and, also, and specifically, in this case, to look for weapons, but once they've detained people, I'm sure they can look for other things as well. And that's backed up. Uh, now, if we're not talking about a designated area, although this uh, drugs provision probably applies to the designated area too, but assuming that we're not talking about a designated area, uh, if it's just uh, in a public place, like a park, I suppose, then if the police have a reasonable belief that the suspect has illegal drugs or related items in his possession or in his vehicle, uh, then pursuant to the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981, Section 82, police have the authority to search his person, vehicle, boat, aircraft, or even animal in a public place and seize any drug of dependence or an instrument suspected to have been used in the manufacture thereof. Interesting case was DPP against Derby 2002, where Derby objected to uh, the fact that a sniffer dog had basically given rise to the search. So Darby was out in a public place, a sniffer dog went up to him and wagged its tail, whatever sniffer dogs do, and it was argued that uh, it was not, uh, there was not a reasonable belief they, they made, uh, the, the sniffer dog already initiated the search, even though he didn't give the police any reasonable belief um, to, to conduct a search. What was held was that uh, using a sniffer dog is not a search, but an alert by the dog can give rise to a reasonable belief, thereby justifying a search. So that way the police get around it. They, um, they can send sniffer dogs around. The sniffer dogs aren't technically searching people, uh, but if the sniffer dogs um, draw the police's attention to someone, that gives rise to a reasonable belief, thereby justifying the search. So it's actually quite quite uh, a clever ruling, I think. So assuming that the uh, police do have the uh, statutory authority, then of course the search and seizure are lawful. All right. If we're not talking about a stop and search provision, then finally we're talking about consent. So in some rare cases, the uh, consent of the suspect is required in order to give the police the authority. That was most um, pertinent in the case of uh, Jameson. The police uh, uh, suspected that Jameson had some stolen goods in his property. They went to his property. They didn't have a. Um, uh, they they didn't follow the correct procedure to obtain search warrants and. They, um, and one of the outcomes is that if they didn't have search warrants, they didn't have any other authority to conduct a search of his place, conduct a search of him, uh, then they needed his genuine consent, or as a general principle, if you don't have the authority by statute or by warrant or by common law, then you need genuine consent, and genuine consent means not by deception, which was uh, one of the arguments that was made in, in that case, and obviously uh, genuine consent means you ask for the person's consent before you reach through the car window and, and grab her handbag, as in the case of Davidson, which I mentioned just before. Uh, but if you do obtain genuine consent, then the search and seizure is authorised. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to go ahead and search someone, according to the Victorian Police Manual, you need some signed authority. You need a signed authority, including details of the police officer who is going to conduct the search. But if there isn't genuine consent, 
we have no stop and search provisions uh, that are applicable. If a person being searched was not under arrest, there's no statutory authority uh, for the police to search and seize anything. So if we we're not talking about warrant statutory authority, then we are then we need to look at common law authority. And there isn't uh, really much there. I've just put that in to, to fill in because in other areas there is common law authority, but so far my notes haven't really given me much for. Uh, bas basically, the tradition of the common law is um, that the police don't have the right to search you unless they have uh, the authorization or a very good reason to search you, and then that would fall under statutory authority or a warrant. So that's just um, something else to bear in mind. I might fill that in a bit later on my map. And if it's not uh, if it's not common law, then it's consent, and I've already covered that. So I might remove these two nodes from the map later. But basically, it's handy to think warrant, statutory authority, common law authority, or consent. And in this case, common law and consent basically slide in under these two. Uh, but just for neatness sake, I've, I've had them here. So that's... Um, so that's a public place. <coughs> now we get to the, the fun and games involved in um, conducting searches at someone's home, at his premises. So there are really two questions here. One is whether the police have the authority to enter, and then the other is whether they have the authority to conduct search and seizure, result, uh, conduct search resulting in the seizure, seizure of uh, said evidential material, because there are times where the police have the authority to conduct a search for one kind of item, and in so doing, they discover another kind of item, which is uh, evidential material. And it's important that uh, it be clear whether the police have the actually have the authority to do so, because that's not automatically a given. So we'll just. Uh, focus on the authority to enter. And usually the authority to enter gives them the authority to search, uh, but we do have to be aware of those distinctions. So um, if we're talking about certain specified offences, the authority, <coughs> the procedure for obtaining a warrant, <coughs> sorry, the, the procedure for obtaining a warrant for entry, search and seizure is uh, stipulated in uh, statute. And I'm just going to open that up and, and run through that. So, generally speaking, uh, if there's a warrant for search and seizure of items from a person's place, then that gives them that gives the police the authority to enter. Because of course, how could they search uh, a place if they can't get in there? So, first of all, let's look at stolen goods. If we if the police want to search someone's place for stolen goods then we refer to the Crimes Act section 92. And um, the, there are two authorities that can issue a warrant, either a magistrate or, a, or an inspector, someone of rank, some, a police officer of the rank of inspector or above, so that's 92 subsection 2. But, it's, but the authority, <coughs> the warrant can only be issued by the inspector or above if the uh, suspect was convicted within the last five years of basically either handling in stolen goods or uh, was convicted of an imprisonable offence involving dishonesty, which I assume is theft or robbery or burglary or fraud or stuff like that, but not necessarily uh, assault or murder or whatever. And either authority has to be satisfied by oath or signed affidavit that the police officer requesting the warrant has reasonable cause to believe that the stolen goods are in the suspect's possession, at his premises, in his vehicle. So um, it's not basically, it, it's not an automatic form. The police officer does actually have to explain why he's requesting the warrant and that warrant has to be, at least according to the statute, it has to be a reasonably um, convincing uh, for either the magistrate or the inspector who's issuing the warrant. And a very important detail with a warrant for stolen for the search of stolen goods is that it gives the police the authority to enter and search the premises for stolen goods only. Not anything else, 
just certain goods. So that that's a very important distinction to make. If we're going to, uh, if the police obtain a warrant for the search for search for stolen goods, which I suppose is easier to get than a warrant for um, a, for more general search, then they can't. Uh, they, they can't seize anything that's not stolen. And uh, going back to this procedure of issuing a warrant, um, the case of Jameson basically delivers the warning it, uh, that if there are major and or intentional irregularities, if there's a serious failure to obtain uh, the ser serious and intentional uh, failure to to follow the procedure, then the evidence may not be admitted on grounds of public policy considerations. In the case of Jameson, it was admitted because the, uh, the justice held that the police officer's failure to obtain search warrants was actually a minor and unintentional irregularity in the procedure, but um, it's very clear that, if, uh, that, that another justice who takes a dimmer view of these things would quite possibly exercise the discretion to exclude that evidential material. Now, when um, the police officers look to obtain a warrant of this nature, the Victorian Police Manual advises that they should uh, basically go to the inspector above, only if it's urgent, uh, and otherwise they should, just, they should go to the magistrate, which is the usual route for obtaining search warrants. If we're not talking about, uh, so so that's uh, stolen goods. Now, the Crimes Act, Section Four Six Five, uh, gives the procedure for a more general search warrant, which is for an indictable offence, and that can be issued by a senior sergeant or above, and a submission has to be made by means of evidence, an oath or a signed affidavit, by the police officer, uh, attesting to a reasonable belief of evidential material in a building, receptacle, or place within 72 hours, so within 72 hours, if I, if I, the police officer, go and conduct the search, that uh, there will be evidence of an indictable offence having been committed, or evidence of something that will afford commission of an indictable offence, like um, prohibited weapons, or, or uh, uh, drug uh, uh, items used to manufacture drugs, or um, evidence of um, something intended to be used to commit an indictable offence, so you know, sim similarly contraband items. And if the warrant is issued, then it gives the police the authority to enter and search the premises for evidence of any indictable offence, so not merely that which they uh, specified, but even things that they didn't know were there, they can search and seize those things too. Now, the, um, <clears throat> the case of uh, Borg, Crown against Borg, 2012, uh, was a case where the police failed that uh, requirement of a signed affidavit. Uh, to the, the affidavits were, were submitted, but they weren't signed, and it was held the evidence was illegally obtained. And uh, so, of course, that uh, evidence was ostensibly inadmissible, um, and I will come back later to Justice Lassery's application of Section 138, Subsection 3 of the Evidence Act, I believe, um, where he actually exercised the discretion to admit the evidence, even though it was um, technically unlawfully obtained. But I'll, I'll get back to that uh, later. So that's for an indictable offence. If we're not talking about an indictable offence, um, generally, the uh, Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981, Section 81, uh, stipulates the procedure for issuing a search warrant for uh, drugs. It has to be issued by a sergeant or above. Contrast that with Senior Sergeant for the Crimes Act requirements, Senior Sergeant for Indictable Offence, Sergeant for Illegal Drugs, and uh, the submission has to be made by evidence of a signed affidavit, reasonable belief within the next 72 hours and either of offence of an offence committed, so illegal drugs, or an offence to be committed, illegal drugs in production, evidential material, drugs lab, uh, or an evidential document, so letters or other documents attesting to 
these sorts of transactions. And interesting, so a couple of points here. If you if they do get the if the police do have a warrant for illegal drugs, they can basically go there and search everyone and everything and in the boats and whatever else is on the prison and seize anything that they find. And the warrant is good for a month. So they get issued a, a warrant for int for a whole month. So they can get the warrant and then wait a little while. And I suppose the nature of these police investigations is they can't always act, so maybe sometimes they have to wait for a shipment to come in or something like that. If we're not talking about drugs, we could be talking about uh, prohibited weapons, which is governed by the Control of Weapons Act 1990, Section 11, has to be issued by a sergeant or above, submission by evidence over the signed affidavit, and there has to be reasonable belief of prohibited weapons on the premises. This uh, warrant gives the uh, gives the police the authority to enter at any time. This overturns the common law uh, rule that uh, they could only do that during daylight hours. So now they, if they get a warrant for, um, pursuant to this ledger to the statute, they can enter day or night, and they can enter by force if necessary, search the premises, search everyone, everything, and seize any prohibited weapons. But I don't believe that it gives them the authority to seize anything else, just prohibited weapons. If they want the authority to seize whatever they find, they have to go back to here to get a search warrant pursuant to Crimes Act Section 465. And if it's not <coughs> the Controlled Weapons Act, then the there is the Graffiti Act if there's a reasonable if the police officer provides reasonable grounds to the magistrate for suspicion of evidential material on the premises pertaining to a graffiti offence. And the search warrant must identify the following. An alleged offence, the premises to be searched, articles for which the search is made, the conditions to which the warrant is subject, whether entry is authorised to be made at any time or during stated hours. So contrast that with the Controlled Weapons Act, which gives, them, gives the police the authority to enter at any time. Here, this has to, the graffiti search warrant has to specify um, whether it is during stated hours or, or, uh, or day or night. And finally, um, the Graffiti Act search warrant is valid for seven days. So if the police want a search warrant pursu uh, pursuant to the Graffiti Act, Section 12, it's only going to last them seven days, whereas the search warrant under the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act is good for a whole month. And so just a quick run through, we're talking about uh, search warrants under particular statutes, then it's for stolen goods, illegal drugs, prohibited weapons, graffiti, or any indictable offence under the Crimes Act. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, at the premises, and that's the question of whether they have obtained, whether the police have the authority granted them by a warrant to enter the suspect's premises. Now, if they don't have a warrant, then the question of statutory authority uh, comes up. And the Crimes Act, Section 459A, uh, gives the police the power to, uh, gives the police the authority to use force to gain entry to someone's premises if necessary, if the police have a reasonable belief that the suspect is committing a serious indictable offence, or that the suspect has committed an offence elsewhere that would be a serious indictable offence in Victoria, or that the suspect is escaping legal custody. So obviously if the police just walk by the house, they'd, they'd, it would be a stretch for them to say that they have a reasonable belief that, uh, some, that a serious indictable offence is going on or has been going on. But um, they do have that authority if they can argue reasonable belief, and then entry would be authorised. If we're not talking about statutory authority, do they have common law authority to enter the premises? And the common law doesn't give them the authority to barge in, but it does give them an implied licence to enter up to the front door, um, as, is, uh, uh, as is derived from the case of Halliday and Neville, 1984. However, this implied licence to enter uh, can be expressly revoked and uh, very, very quickly thereafter it becomes trespass and 
refer to the cases of Plenty and Dillon and Robson and Hammett um, for, for uh, authorities in that. So if there's no common law authority, <coughs> then we're talking about genuine consent. And again, coming back to the case of Jameson, um, if they don't, if they don't have genuine consent, then um, they don't have the authority to be on the premises. And if the question of, of genuine consent does come up, the onus of proving consent is on the prosecution on the balance of probabilities. Refer to the case of the Crown against Myers, 1987, in which case the entry would be authorized. Uh, if so, if they do get consent, the entry is authorized. But if the consent is revoked, they have to leave within a reasonable time. Now, what is reasonable time is, of course, uh, to be determined by referring to the facts of the case. And one question that, that I have that I couldn't really find any notes on was uh, if the consent is not revoked, what is a reasonable amount of time for the police to actually hang around and, and you know, speak to people and search the place? So I'm, I'm not very clear on that. But I, I assume that if the police stay for an unreasonable time, then the occupier would probably ask them to leave, and that's probably why there isn't very much on it, if, if anything at all. So that's uh, the question of authority to enter the premises. And just to recap, so we looked at authority to conduct search and seizure in a public place, and that was warrant, statute, there isn't really anything in common law, but possibly consent. Uh, so warrant and statute, and that really falls, if we're talking about statute, we're talking about um, arrest, or uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just expand that. So if you have warrant, pretty obvious. If it's statute, then you're talking mostly about arrest or stop and search uh, or drugs or weapons. So that's that, public place. And now we've just gone through this question of whether the police had the authority to enter the premises. And assuming that they did have the authority to enter the premises, did they have the authority to conduct search and seizure of said evidential material? So if they've got the authority to enter, for example, to search for stolen goods, and they come across uh, drugs, do they have the authority in that case to seize the drugs? So, of course, uh, does the warrant empower them to seize the um, said evidential material? Well, if so, that's pretty obvious. It's lawfully authorized. But let's say they have a warrant for X and they find Y. <coughs> Are there any statutes that give the police the authority to, uh, to seize items that are not under the purview of the warrant that they used to gain entry? Well, then it's a question of a genuine inadvertent discovery. So if they, if the police got a warrant for prohibited weapons and they walked in and found a drugs lab, was it a genuine inadvertent discovery or did they rifle through ev everything and, and pick through every little box and then discover something? That wouldn't be genuinely inadvertent. It has to be a genuine, sorry, genuinely inadvertent discovery. In the case of uh, Sheik, Fashions and Jones is worth looking at for that. Um, and if the, basically if the police do not um, uh, walk in on, on very, very obvious evidence of a different offense, then the warrant for a specific item a specific kind of evidence does not justify a general search, so that's to be uh, taken from the case of cases of Appleby, Ludwig, and uh, Rigney Hopkins. So, assuming that there was a genuinely inadvertent discovery, then again we return to the Crimes Act, Section 459A, of a reasonable belief. So, if they walk in, if the police walk in and find uh, very, very suspicious looking items, that gives rise to a reasonable belief of um, some involvement in a serious indictable offence. So again, it has to be a serious indictable offence and it has to be a genuinely 
inadvertent discovery. Now I'm not clear on what would be the case if it were not a serious indictable offence. If it were merely an indictable offence, uh, but that's uh, worth discussing in the comments. Alright, so if we're not talking about a genuinely inadvertent discovery, then uh, the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Act 1981 uh, Section 81 gives the police the authority, specifically with drugs, um, to go and seize material even if they don't have the authority pursuant to the warrant that they obtained. So they've got a warrant for graffiti or weapons or stolen goods, but there was a reasonable suspicion that, the, that a drug of dependence or an instrument used in the manufacture thereof was on the premises. Then, even though the warrant doesn't give them the authority, the statute does give them the authority. So basically for, if we want to put it in really bas uh, really straightforward terms, if the police <coughs> suspect that you have drugs, uh, or you're producing drugs, manufacturing drugs, um, but they don't have evidence of your involvement in the drug trade, but they do have evidence of your involvement in some other offense, or at least a reasonable belief, then they can obtain a search warrant for something else and if they happen to come across drugs when they break into your house then uh, they have the statutory authority pursuant to the DPCSA to uh, search to, to seize that potential evidential material. So if we're not talking about statutory authority is there common law authority? Well there was a case of Ghani and Jones, 1970, and conditions were stipulated by the justices concerned of a reasonable belief that a serious offence has been committed. And if there's a reasonable belief that the items they come across are the fruit of a crime or an instrument of a crime or material ev evidence of a crime, then that is acceptable, or that was acceptable in that ruling. A couple of other details are that the police don't have the authority to keep the items for any longer than necessary for the investigation and also the police cannot argue that uh, the consequence of their um, of, of, of their conduct uh, justifies uh, an, an, an unwarranted search so the lawfulness is really determined by the reasonableness of the uh, beliefs of the police officers at the time, not by the consequences. So they can't say that the, um, the conduct that they engaged in resulted in the procurement of important evidential material. They have to argue that the way they obtained the evidential material was very important. Now it has been applied in two cases of note, Goldberg and Brown and, the, and Greer against the Commissioner of Police, uh, but it was criticized in terms of plastics and protective customs. So there is precedent, uh, but the keys of the precedent are reasonable belief of a serious offence um, and reasonable belief that basically it's got to be arguable that it was, it's re it was really very obvious that there, was, there were items there that, were, that had a, a connection to a crime. If we're not talking about common law authority, then again it's back to genuine consent. Um, and we've already gone through that, that the that once the police are around, they uh, they basically have to have the consent. Uh, if, they, if they don't have authority to enter, if they don't have authority to look around um, in, in those rare cases, and if the occupier of the premises objects to their being there and objects to their searching through things, then it can be argued that uh, it was unlawful. But usually, once the police are I once the police have the authority to enter the premises, chances are there will be at least one statute granting them the authority to also search and seize evidential material. So that's that for the authority, the lawful authority to search the suspect, search the suspect's premises, search the suspect's possessions, and seize evidential material. And let's say. We was authorized. Well, then the next uh, couple questions are really about the type of search. So there are three types of search. There's a frisk search, a 
which is just a, a sort of light pat, I suppose. Uh, there's an ordinary search, which is going through your pockets and kind of looking through your stuff a bit more deeply. And then there's a strip search, which of course needs no introduction. And uh, curiously, there are no Victorian statutory provisions for uh, the types of search. And my guess is that because it's already stipulated in the Commonwealth Crimes Act, Crimes Act 1914, Commonwealth, uh, there is, it's probably politically inadvisable to pass any further legislation because the, um, author on the, the, the procedures of the, of the Commonwealth Crimes Act are pretty convenient, they work pretty well for the police. And the relevant sections are that a frisk search, the, require the procedure for a frisk search um, are, uh, is in 3ZE, for an ordinary search, 3ZF, and for a strip search, 3ZH. For frisk and ordinary search, it's just about there being a reasonable suspicion uh, of evidential material and or, and or a seizable item, and that it's prudent to conduct such a search. It, of, uh, of much greater interest is uh, whether a strip search is um, justified, and with a strip search, the police have to have a reasonable suspicion that there is evidential material, not forensic, not forensic evidential material, um, but rather evidential material or seizable item, and a reasonable, reasonable suspicion, reasonable belief that the strip search is necessary, and very importantly, that there is authorization from a superintendent or higher. That's key. There has to be authorization in addition to the reasonable belief of of not only the existence of the evidential material or seizable item, but the necessity of the strip search as well. And if uh, the police engaged in a strip search without the authority, then even though the, they had the authority to conduct the search, the evidential material um, would not be obtained by an authorized search, rather it would be obtained by an unauthorized type of search. So those are basically all the, the considerations of the lawfulness, so coming right back to the start, of whether the evidential material was lawfully obtained. So if the evidential material is lawfully obtained, admissible at trial, end of story. But what if, for some reason, the evidential material was not lawfully obtained and is ostensibly not admissible? Then we've got the question of judicial discretion. And judicial discretion is very straightforwardly whether there is a precedent for nevertheless admitting this ostensibly inadmissible e evidential material. So ca are there cases where the police have, have, have acquired, have procured, obtained evidential material that's not really admissible um, and, if, uh, and, and it was nevertheless admitted by a judge? So if we prefer, so the first question might be whether there was a minor and unintentional irregularity. So if we're talking about a small, what, what, the, what the judge would consider a small mistake, uh, not signing the affidavit, not signing a particular form, not, not filling out a form in the correct procedure, stuff like that, uh, then the case of Jameson uh, gives precedent for nevertheless uh, admitting this evidential material, um, but if the if the mistake is such that it would trigger public policy considerations, then the justices or judge is unlikely to admit that material. And so, if we're not talking about a minor and unintentional irregularity, then the question is really whether the seriousness of the crime and the seriousness of the crime and the nature of the evidence obtained weigh heavily in favour of admitting the evidential material. So whatever the case may be, the argument has been made by the prosecution that the desirability of admitting the material uh, outweighs the undesirability of, of admitting this ostensibly inadmissible material. And the reason there comes from the case of Borg, where it was a murder case, so it was very serious, and it was a failure to sign an affidavit, which is quite serious, um, and of course made the relevant evidence of this murder um, illegal. But the DPP the, uh, and 
and so the DPP had the unenviable task of convincing the court of the desirability of admitting the evidence and the um, and the Evidence Act section 138 subsection 3 gives the judge, the trial judge, the discretion to admit illegally obtained evidence. And in this case, Justice Lasry did apply section 138 subsection 3 of the Evidence Act and did allow that uh, evidence to be admitted, uh, but it's by no means a given for the prosecution and generally speaking the police prosecution are held to very stringent standards, uh, at least by statute, if, if not in practice, uh, because it is uh, a matter of serious public policy uh, that, uh, that people have trust in, the, in the, the honesty of the criminal justice system. So uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a very, very minor and unintentional irregularity in the obtaining of the evidence, there's a good chance that it might nevertheless be admitted but I imagine that in the real world, judges who are faced with these sorts of considerations are probably pretty unhappy about it. That's, uh, that's going to be my assumption. So just to recap, the first question is whether the, the central question is whether the evidential material was lawfully obtained, and if it wasn't, um, uh, or, and in order to ascertain whether it was lawfully obtained, it, was the question is whether the police had the lawful authority within a public place or the premises. If it's in a public place, did they have a warrant for arrest? Did they, were they empowered by statute? Are we talking about arresting, stopping and searching? Is it to do with drugs or weapons? Um, is there consent? Uh, if we're talking about the premises, did the police have the authority to enter? And did they have the authority to conduct a search and seize said evidential material even if said evidential material wasn't actually specified in the warrant that they used to gain entry to the suspect premises and um, if they do have the lawful authority and we're talking about a search, probably a strip search, did they follow the correct procedures in getting authorization for that and going about it the right way? And finally, if uh, the police made a boo-boo and the um, evidential material was not lawfully obtained, um, is there any chance that it will nevertheless be admitted? Uh, is there a chance that the trial judge will exercise, will apply Evidence Act Section 138, Subsection 3, and use his discretion to admit the ostensibly inadmissible evidential material on the basis that the desirability of admitting this material outweighs the desirability of not admitting it. So that's been my presentation on search and seizure of evidential material according to Victorian law in 2013. I hope this has helped you to get your head around this rather large and finicky topic. It's very much a topic of many, 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 many trees and one poor forest that often gets obscured. But remember that if you keep your if you, if you use the question of uh, lawful obtainment of evidence equaling admissibility as your, as your guiding star, as your compass, then you probably won't go wrong. So thank you very much for listening. Please feel free to comment down below. Uh, check out my blog, tabulalex.blogspot.com, and uh, feel free to shower me with praise and maybe goodies as well for all the hard work I've put in in recording this creating and recording this presentation. So thanks very much and I look forward to recording the next one.